Wow. Boy, folks, you just missed it. We were just going off, absolutely going off ab- about um, caffeine. It's yeah. Say calcium. <laughs> Welcome back to this week's episode of Three People Co-Working at a Cafe. <laughs> oh, God, I can't do that. I can't co-work. No, Dude. but it just looks like we're... No, I know, but, <laughs> but I I could, you, couldn't, you couldn't catch me at a co-working space doing a cafe thing. I'd like to try to sell something to you. Um, you were saying that that energy or not energy energy drink stocks <laughs> were some of the best performing ones. I, I only thought of Celsius. Yeah, well, there's Monster too. Yeah, and then, I mean that's one of the top performers of the last twenty years. Yeah, like people love their caffeine. Yeah, including me. Yeah, not yeah. me. I can't handle it. Yeah, he gets he gets scared and starts crying. <laughs> That's to the point of... where he'll be in Greece, literally with his brother, and his brother will be like, "You need to calm down and stop drinking." You're, you're ruining the trip for everybody. Oh no! Were you really ruining? The no, trip no, no, for no, no, no. I everyone was fine. I was just like, I, I, I'm carrying around this horrible fear that burden everywhere we go, even though we are on Greek islands. That fear yeah. is feel what bad. That fear is what creates is is what powers civilization. Yeah. I had my first real experience with caffeine was when I took the SATs. Oh, yeah. And I did not ever really drink coffee. And I thought, you know what? I'm going to give coffee a shot. I'm going to drink some coffee before this thing. And it was a huge mistake. All it did was give me the worst bubble guts. (laughs) So I'm sitting there. Gurgling? Oh, yeah. And it was so quiet. And I felt bad for the people around me because my stomach was just going. And I'm just thinking, not only is it embarrassing because everybody knows I've got a shit, <laughs> but it's disruptive. You know what my score ended up being? This is back in the old SAT 1600. days. 1600. It was like 1080. It what was, was that out of? Fe- out of 1600. Oh. I got like a D. <laughs> oh. The equivalent of a D on my SATs. But look at me now, mom. Well... <laughs> Do you still drink caffeine? Uh, do I still drink caffeine? Oh, I can't have Diet Coke anymore. Why? Because I like it too much. Oh, <laughs> oh. you can't have it out of out of like you're you're denying yourself. Because I have addictive personality. Oh, so, man. Yeah. What else are you addicted to? Coffee. coffee? Yeah. Okay, straight up black iced coffee. Yeah, and exercise. You're addicted to exercise. Yeah. I'm addicted to exercise. Yeah. Well. Yeah. yeah. Would you do you do you think that you are orthorexic? No, no, I just endorphin junkie. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I saw you go mm. crazy on the bike. On the bike, yeah. Yeah, no, it's super fun. 300 miles a week. 300 miles a week. Um, oh, you should have just biked here. Why didn't you, why'd you fly? <laughs> no, yeah. I, I was thinking about, like, I do want to do that trip one day, like biking across the U.S. Yeah, hey, I think it'd be fun. I tried to do that from Santa Barbara down to here, and it was an utter disaster failure. What happened? Uh, first of all, the Amtrak, we took the train up there and they don't stop for more than 20 seconds at their train stops. Oh, really? It's like the subway. And my two friends and I had our bikes and all of our gear and the train stops and the conductor gets off. One of the conductors gets off and he goes, oh yeah, you guys got to walk your bikes down to the luggage car. And we said, okay. So we start walking down and he's looking around and he gets back on the train, and as we're walking down towards the luggage car, the train leaves. And it's like, why did he not say, yeah, hang on, there's people about to get on. So we had to wait, like, oh, it, it backtracked us, it pushed us back by like six hours. Yeah. So we arrived in Santa Barbara at night, had to find our camping site at night and like set up tents. So then we got a late start in the morning, and then what ended up happening was one of uh, one of my friends got blown off the road by an 18 wheeler just the wind took her off and she fell and cracked her her helmet and we had to we had to just we we covered like 90 miles and then we had to leave we, we just said fuck it awful yeah it was dangerous i wasn't wearing a helmet i was oh. reckless i remember ripping it 
in top gear. I had the clip-ons, and I was in top gear going down this hill just like, just going probably 40 miles an hour with no shirt on either. <laughs> oh, no. You could have gotten all crayon. sorts of pain. Crayon mode, yeah. But it was real smooth. It was in like Montecito. Yeah. Probably ripped past Oprah's house. Anyway, we have a, we, we should have probably a, introdu- introduce. Yeah, who are you? Who the first, I? the first guest, the first guest of the Pay Pigs. Such an I'd, honor. I, I well, I think um, there would have been riots if you weren't a first guest. You are really. You are by far our most requested. Really? Yes. That's so constantly. Sweet. Even me and Ben will just be yammering on about whatever, and people are like, "I want Kyla." <laughs> Amazing. And we say, "What about us?" Truly, it doesn't matter. Yeah. yeah. Oh, happy to... And here she is. Kyla Scanlon. Yeah, sure. Introduce yourself. I, oh, I feel like yeah. a lot of people know her, but yeah. she's a um, she's a very popular economic Yeah, how would analyst? you define yourself? A financial so, creator? Uh, yeah, I've been, saying, <laughs> I've been saying author, educator, creator, so I'm trying to... I don't, I don't know if I can call myself an author. Somebody got mad at me Why? for saying that because they're like, your book's not published. Oh, my God. And I was like, ah, oh, but... <laughs> so we're allowed to talk about the book? Yeah. Oh, okay, yeah, great. Yeah, it's public news. Amazing. Yeah. She's got a book coming out got a book in coming April out. 2024. April 2024. So you're a pre-author. Pre-author. About to be author. But the book's done. It's in transmittal right now. Yeah. So How many pages is it? About 300. Damn, perfect size for a book. Thanks. Absolutely. Is it paperback? To, uh, paperback and hardcover. Yeah, right. Yeah. Man, this guy's well, hardcover. Nuts. Why? Because he loves books. <laughs> this boy reads. That's good. Yeah, books are good. I like yeah, we books. were talking about my book cover earlier, too. Yeah. Yeah, he's giving me good advice. Who did it? Me. You did the cover? Well, we're that's actually still like in process, but... Damn, we so probably can't talk about the cover. Can't talk about the cover. You can't, can't call yourself yet. a graphic designer yet, either. No, I don't think graphic designers would appreciate that. Yeah. I'm like in Canva. You get a lot of hate on the internet, don't you? I mean, we'll talk about that. <laughs> no, no, I don't mean hate. Well, because we were talking about Everybody how no, no, you get a lot of you get a lot of. Um, we brought you here today to talk about how everyone thinks you fucking suck. That's not what I meant. Fuck. <laughs> about how there's a lot of there's a lot of people who who uh, who like, like to tell you that they think you're wrong. Yeah, I there's and, a lot and of that. As we were just getting there's a lot set of nice up, people too. Of course, yeah. Yeah, uh, you seem to nice, get a lot of love on the internet. <laughs> yeah. I would hope That's that the nice people it. outweigh the bad. Yeah, I just think, I mean, you all know, like, the bad people are, well, bad is subjective, but, like, you know, the loud people are loud. Yes. Yeah. All it takes for me is one negative comment to overpower 20 positive ones. 20? I, I don't see, I see the one negative and I, I don't see it. And you're just like, oh, this person is exactly right. I this do person's suck. right about me. Yeah. They know that I do suck. I, I want, I do want to get into that. How how it the hatred? Well, not the hatred, but just the, the getting pushed back and being being someone who no 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 <laughs> because that <laughs> shut up. <laughs> we will get into that because it is a shared experience, is what I'm getting at, and it also it 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 says something, but I can't quite pin it down what it says and uh, who it's. Because it's mostly like boomers. <laughs> we're, we're laughing at Emil's squeaky chair. Oh, oh yeah. No, that's great, dude. Move, move for a second. Yeah, cool. It's okay. Sound off in the comments if you can hear the squeaky chair. I'll just say like this. You. Yeah. Okay, so your book is coming. Let's plug the book first. Book. Well, still come back when the book comes yes, out. That's but so we, far yeah. we want people to prepare April. and like pre-order it, right? Yeah, yeah. Oh, pre-order okay. Go pre-order soon. the book. It'll be up soon. It'll be up soon. It's gonna be, can I yeah. get an advanced copy? Yeah, I'll have a galley. Wait, there's going to be like a basic and an advanced version? No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> when did, so, <laughs> thank you very much. That's crazy. So, so, wait, when did it come out? April, April. 2024. Oh, shit. Wow. Okay. It, now, how does that work? So the title of the book is what? In This Economy. In This Economy. And yeah. it's all about, I'm assuming it's about vibes. Well, it's really about like the economy and... Just inflation and the labor market. Um, the Federal Reserve is a big part of it, too. So just walking people through the basics of the economy. And it's meant to be like an introductory guide. Gotcha. Yeah. But also be fun to read. And yeah. then at the end, it's like a discussion of solutions and like how you can make systems work better, policy decisions that could happen, things like that. Yeah. We would love that. Um, and there's a lot of illustrations you've done. Too, yeah, to help I'm the illustrator. Drive these points home. Yeah. 
That's really helpful. You're doing, yeah. you're doing uh, God's work. You're doing God's work. You're doing God. <laughs> what we, you're doing what we initially set out to do, which was to make this otherwise very convoluted world, dense, yeah. boring world, it's entertaining fun. and applicable to people's everyday lives. Yeah, exactly. Which uh, brings us into vibes, I think, vibes. because that was the big thing that we, our sort of pre-production texts, if you want to call it that, uh, I feel like we were all pretty excited to talk about the disparity between the data that says that everything is good and booming yeah. and just on the cusp of being better than ever, and yet there's the vibe out there that feels like it's anything but. And yep. it's a weird, it's a weird, it's weird, because depending on where you look. Say weird again. It's weird. <laughs> Well, squeak your chair again. <laughs> it's, it, I'm kidding. And depending on where you look and what the algorithm feeds you, things are either, yeah, better than ever or just about to completely yeah, collapse. Yeah. And I'm talking about fucking Sven, what's his name? Henry? It, oh, yeah. He has me blocked on Twitter. Ooh. He blocked me years ago. Zero Hedge. Um, yeah, the Dean Rizem. Yeah, those yeah. G- the guys who are just constantly. But so a big part of what you've been, you've almost like, coined the term yourself is the vibe session. The vibe I did session. coin that term. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So can you elucidate on like what you, how do you define a vibe session? So it's really based on sentiment. So it's like a temporary <laughs> decline in sentiment, despite the economic data saying that things are okay. Mm-hmm. So it's trying to point to like human driving the economy because people are like the underlying force of the economy. Right. So like consumer spending is 70% of GDP, you know, so how people feel matters how they spend. And so the whole idea is like we really need to pay attention to how people are feeling and like how they're responding to certain economic data points. Um, And I think there's like a whole conversation about how like the economic data that we look at isn't always reflective of reality. Like you were saying, like I don't know if some of the numbers really matter for describing like how the average person is experiencing their day to day. But it's like super tough. Um, There's like a lot of debate on Twitter about it because (laughs) <laughs> the tough part about it is like it could be way worse mm-hmm. and it, like but if you say that to somebody it's like well whatever yeah. like right i feel bad right now <clears throat> and so that's the really tough part about it is like the economy should be a lot worse than it is the labor market honestly should be in shambles based on how fast the federal reserve has raised rates in order to tame inflation the fact that we had like immaculate disinflation which is inflation going down a lot without a lot of pain in the labor market or for anybody in particular, really. Um, Like the biggest impact that we saw to the labor market was tech and finance. Like every other industry is pretty much booming, Um, but it still feels bad because of cost of living, because of the housing crisis, because of different policy measures. And then I think there's just a lot of um, doomerism. And then this will be my final point. But like there's this idea, too, that I think that people feel like they have to project or show anxiety because if you're not showing that it means you don't care and so the only way that you can signal that you care is by showing that you're worried and by maybe saying like well things can't be okay they're not okay um and there's also a protectionist measure to that too like if you're like oh things are not fine then if they end up not being fine you didn't get your hopes up you know yeah yeah i also i feel like uh any time not from an economic standpoint, but any time that I've just personally been feeling good and enjoying my life and being on a on an upswing yeah. and feeling happy. Uh, oh, awesome! The lawnmower guy's going, they but we we it. know that they can't hear it. Um, I I I refrain from saying anything about that because, like on on Twitter or on Instagram, talking about how because who knows what tragedy may have just occurred. Who yeah. knows who may have just gotten laid off? Who knows what uh, injustice has just occurred this week yeah. or is is part of the general conversation? There seems to be, yeah, this um, shame and guilt around feeling optimistic and feeling positive, whether it's in, in yeah, your own this, bubble or, <clears throat> or yeah, on a, on a macro scale. But I think it's this like, time is unique, right, in the sense that even though economic indicators say things are good, People have uh, the negative sentiment of time, like like 2008, when things were actually really bad. Um, so I think that's when it, it's like, why do people feel uniquely bad right now, even though mm. 
economic indicators say they should be feeling much more positively about it. Yeah, do you, and what? I was going to ask, do you, do you think that it's kind of how, do you think it's sort of akin to the wall of worry that a bull market is said to climb? Like it doesn't feel good as it's going. It doesn't feel like it should, everything should just be going up and up. And that's just because that's, that's the way that it works. It, it, there's an uncertainty, but that uncertainty is just what kind of keeps everybody. Do you know what I'm talking about? Like people feel like they have to be uncertain, even if. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I guess I'm, I'm, I'm looking at it through the rather narrow lens of just the stock market itself mm. and not anything else, which is, yeah, that the old adage that. Stock market is not the economy. Yeah. Yeah. And just <clears throat> that, yeah, the, a bull market um, climbs a wall of worry. But to what you were, you what you were saying. Um, well, I'll tell you what. I mean, I've because I knew Kyle was coming on. I've been thinking about it yeah, and like I listening see your to these. <laughs> well, just like listening to people talk about it and stuff like that. And uh, I mean, you talked about it a little bit just now, but I. I think. People want to differentiate between like. All things considered, things are pretty good. Mm -hmm. But I don't think people are. I mean, your average person is not going like, well, it could be Relatively a lot worse. You need speaking, to yeah. you need to think yeah. about all of these things. And not only that, I think, you know, they're comparing this to 2008. I think since that time period, uh, I don't know, the like political landscape and yeah. um, emotional landscape of people's financial well-being has completely changed um, in a way that, <clears throat> and then I mean, when you go forward a couple more just election cycles, like from 2016 on, even politicians were talking about things differently in a way that like they didn't before. I mean, in 2016, you had Donald Trump who was talking about it in a very uh, abrasive way, but was still kind of stirring up, um, you know, worker sentiment. And then you had uh, Bernie Sanders talking about it in a very different way. Um, and those things have only kind of ramped up. And I think. People have now all of these things very front of mind every day. Yeah, um, because it's social media. Social media, and I think they've just become aware of. I mean, I think before before two thousand eight, I think people were very like willing to accept things as like this is how America is run, and and you know you need to swallow that pill. I think there's Do you been think a, there's like a lack of hope. Do you think that's what it is? Uh, I think there is a lack of hope, but I think people at least understand that like, oh, it doesn't have to be like this. Mm. And I wish it wasn't like this. A different and world so exist, yeah. people, you know, and I think it is very political. I think a lot of this, like, I think if you go down, it, uh, people's, the way they feel about the economy is going to be linked to how they vote. I think. And like who's um, in charge? Yes. Mm. Uh, yeah. so right now, Republicans but, would probably <clears throat> feel pretty shitty. Well, you can see that in the the NFIB, which is the National Federation of Small Businesses or something like that. You can see their sentiment fluctuates based on who's in office. Yeah. Right. And so, but not only that, like, I think people have gotten to a point where, like, so saying things, all things considered, are pretty good. I don't know how much that means for, like, the average person when, like, things are still very bad. Uh, I mean, for example, like the inflation thing, everyone wants to point to, now that inflation has come down, right? It was out of control. It was hitting like nine, ten percent, and now we're seeing it at like two to three percent. That's like good news for everyone, and everyone should be celebrating. But at the same time, prices are still going up, just at a much slower rate. So, and they're not going to come down. So, things are still way more expensive than they were just a couple of years ago, and people are still going to feel that. And that is um, like. That is directly impacting rent. And, um, you know, I think it's like we're, what is the number? We are, this was from Bloomberg, U.S. rent just $16 shy of record as shelter costs drive July inflation. So, yeah, rent was 90% of July inflation. So, you know, <clears throat> I mean, we live in L.A. There's a housing crisis here, obviously. It's like uh, harder and harder to find a place to live that you can afford. And all um, new construction not only looks like shit, but... It costs, it's like three grand for a studio apartment. It's ridiculous. So, you know, that's just, it's just like, it's all, um, you know, we talk about, 
I like your point about the strike stuff where you talk about like how sometimes things that, um, that might seem bad are good, are good things. And I, like, I agree. It's nice when you see these labor actions happening, like the UPS thing where they're winning a better contract. And that's the result of a hot labor market where they feel they can do these things without, um, because well, management knows that they have to respond. Right. Which is great. But at the same time, like we still live in a, like, so that's great. But then you, you're like, but we still live in a country with like very few labor protections. Um, and like, you know, you have to fight because you're not going to, you're not going to get any support from the federal government. And even the few labor protections we have, you're not, they're not going to be seriously enforced. Um, yeah, I don't know. I think people are just becoming aware of all of this and, and are, are maybe like acutely aware of what it means to like live in a world where there's zero uh, safety net. Mm-hmm. And it's hard to like, I don't know, it's hard to hear. Yeah, I was reading like Paul Krugman and Robert Reich be like, who are guys I don't have any real issue with, but it's sometimes that like democratic with a capital D um, talk that makes me feel a little crazy it's like uh like when they passed the affordable care act it's like everyone's lives are different now we did it like you know we fixed it it's like no you didn't you 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 know forced me to get health care from these private insurance companies and still unaffordable and And if if i don't don't do it it, i have to pay a huge tax so but i don't know they talk about it as if we've made these monumental changes to people's lives but i don't think people material feel materially feel that yeah um yeah i don't know so i think when everyone's talking about it i'm like this kind of makes sense to me i don't it doesn't feel good (laughs) yeah i can i can understand why it wouldn't feel good i mean like i didn't even mention healthcare, but it's like yeah everyone lives every american lives with that uh daily i mean there's a you grab that right on that yep that paper I just, no one can figure out the American, I look at this, I just got a, don't show my address if it's on here, this came in the mail yesterday for, what is that? A, a bill for $3,045 from an urgent care clinic, and, what did you do? I had no idea, and of course there's no, there's no itemized, it just says new charges. You just have to call them and I get called, that I called down. this morning, I owe $80, but, the, but, but like, that's, I mean, my night was like ruined last night. I was like, my, my life is over. I, I owe, <laughs> I owe UCLA medical center $3,000. Uh, and so I don't know. It's like, a, it's, it's hard for me to imagine a, a world in which people start feeling optimistic about this, uh, this lot without like real systemic changes. Um, so- unless you're drawing it down like political lines where, uh, you know, you are like happy that your guy, um, because that, I think that is a problem. I think Democrats might have a framing issue when they're like, when everyone's saying, oh, the economy is so bad. But by all accounts, Biden seems to be bouncing the economy back in a Yeah, fiscal policy way. is a yeah. big driver. Yeah. Sorry, I feel like I've been talking for a while. It is a podcast. <laughs> <laughs> um, but no, I've just been thinking about, I mean, Student loans are about to be turned yeah, back on. Yeah, that's a uh, concerning And, thing. like, that's not an anecdotal. That, that's, that's like, 45 million people who are going to get hit with the hundreds of dollars. I just read a not more. Bank of America thing this morning where they said, it's not going to be that big of a deal, though. No, it will be. Yeah. yeah. It'll be a big hit to income. Yep. Yeah. And it, it is also seeing the, the credit, American's credit, hitting the <laughs> trillion-dollar mark. I saw that adjusted for inflation, it's actually... Twenty eh, percent below that, and some people consider it a negative. I don't know how to feel about it. I feel like it's a bit of a positive, actually, because people are like you said, they feel good. They're spending money, yeah. And it's not necessarily that they're like panicking and going out and buying a big screen TV. Uh, although I am curious to see Target's earnings this week and and Walmart. I mean, by the time this comes out, it'll have already come and gone. But yeah, I I, I think that there's I'd like to hear a little bit more about, so what, what do you think, I guess, what, do you, what is your gauge? What, what temperature are you getting from, from the vibes out there? Because mm. there is that juxtaposition between the vibes, the contrast between the vibes and the actual data. Yeah, I mean, it's really tough. So I, I would say like most people are feeling pretty bad still, like you were saying. 
I think there's a lot of worries about healthcare. There's a lot of worries about housing. Uh, I say that wrong. Housing. <laughs> I, I, I just <laughs> I found that out the other day. Did someone um, say it? Did someone leave a comment and say, oh, yeah. also, you say things? <laughs> no, like I, I made a video about housing in Minnesota because Minnesota has built a lot of affordable housing and like subsidized rent for a lot of people. Yeah. And apparently I say that word wrong. Tomato, so, tomato. Yeah, I know. Who gives a shit? I, I hear what you're saying. Thanks. But um, yes, yeah, so I think that's a big problem too. And then just... um. Like you're saying, there's almost dissatisfaction with the system that's in place. And I feel like every generation says that. Like every generation is like, oh, I hate the system. But I feel like now because of social media, because of what you were saying, like we're just so exposed to it on the day to day. Yes. Almost everybody knows somebody who's had like a big healthcare event that has essentially bankrupt them. Um, a lot of people know people who can't get housing or, you know, it's just a big part of your daily or your income and your expenses. Uh, so I would say like that's why people are feeling bad. It's just kind of like, it feels very stagnant and it's like, where do we go from here? And part of, so Fitch downgraded the United States of America and the downgrade isn't that big of a deal, but the part of the reason that they downgraded the U S so like said the U S wasn't as credit worthy as it once was, was because of the political polarization in the United States because of the debt ceiling, because we can't really get anything done. And I think that was really emblematic of how things uh, operate here. It's like, it's always fight, fight, fight now. Um, versus maybe there was more agreement back in the day. Oh, yeah. yeah. Right. Well, it also it, <clears throat> it also seems like a reluctance. I mean, when we're talking about it politically, it's, um, you know, it's quite, it's, it's much more difficult for the incumbent to talk about this in an exciting way. But it's easier for, you know, it's the Republicans right now who are not in holding the executive office. So they get to be like, oh, he completely fucked everything up. But I, also, if I was the Biden administration, I wouldn't shy away from some of the, like you were talking about, uh, like in the 1980s, the average home price was around four and a half times the median income. And now it's closer to seven, seven and, and a half, half times. Yeah. I mean, to like people feel that, right? Like people want to own a home yeah. and it's, <clears throat> it's especially in America, dream, right? Yeah. It's the one way to actually build wealth in this country. Which is, I think, super problematic. Yeah. What I, should we do? The, the American dream owning a home? No, no, no. I think that the fact that like the bottom 50% of Americans, all their wealth is in real estate. It's in their home that they own. Mm. And so like one thing that I think would be really beneficial is giving people equity or ownership. So like helping set them up with stocks or helping them like get shares in the businesses that they're a part of, because that's what like the top, you know, 10% have is they have ownership in businesses right. and that generates real wealth versus like using homes as a speculative asset. This is like my hottest take. I think people do not agree. We want your hot take. No, I agree well, with you though. Like a home shouldn't be like, a tool of speculation. And that's part of the problem with the housing crisis is boomers, you know, they're in these homes, 38 million people have no mortgage. You know, they're sitting on like this gold mine. They're not going to sell. And so I think that's part of the problem is like, it's turned into this speculative tool when really it's like a human right to have housing. I also think home ownership kind of like radicalizes people and, yeah. and makes them, turns them into a, uh... Because they they feel this like this is my they want, this is my retirement fund yeah. this is my everything, everything. and so you, yeah uh, anything that could lead to which lower is understandable property. I mean yeah, yeah. Um, I think that's why I mean we've talked about it in a previous iteration of the show but uh, you know there's the shift from people's um, retirement plans being pensions which yeah. would pay out automatically yeah. to you know four hundred one ks and it all being up to how the economy is doing and everything has really um, warped people's brains on yeah. how they feel about things. I mean, yeah, the, you know, we, we pray to the almighty stock market. Yeah. That's, that's my biggest gripe is that the, the vibe thing that I notice personally, as if it's some revelational revelation, uh, cause it's pretty obvious to me, um, is just the, the gigification of everything, yeah. the subscriptionification. Yeah. If I can make up a word of everything where it's just a new way to just fucking milk everybody for money. Just it's, it's, a, that's the part that gets me that's exhausting because it feels like it's, um, not a pyramid scheme, but it, it's similar to a pyramid scheme in the sense that eventually you run out of things and eventually we're going to reach a point where it's like, okay, they're going to have to get more creative with. Yeah. Don't you remember NFTs and, uh, well, digital, yeah, digital ownership. That's where, <laughs> and also it feels like, because by the way, I'm trying. Here, no, no, try this, try this here, sit up straight and put your legs oh under your, it's seat. fine. It's okay. No, 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 but watch, try putting your legs under your seat and it forces your posture up. 
so that you're or just like this crisscross applesauce you need yeah. to let's do that yeah yeah there you go genius <laughs> quick swap this is all staying in the episode no good I like that but um <laughs> all right. yeah this is so much better just it's it's frustrating to see all of the the power and the wealth and the the good profit margins and all of that shit sort of concentrated among the big tech heavyweights and it just feels like our entire it, we've we've just got the we're an entertainment economy and we're a consumption economy and we don't make anything like we used to and there's I mean, I know yeah, we just added 800,000 manufacturing jobs. That's that's what I was going to follow up with. I'm being a bit. Um, you got his mind. What's what's the word? Parabolic, not parabolic. Hyperbolic. Mm-hmm. Hyperbolic. Thank you. And. Yeah, I, I catastrophize in that way where I just feel like, what do we even do? What do we what do we do besides have these companies milk the people for every cent that they've got and then brag about ever increasing margins and revenues that keeps the stock market juiced, that keeps everybody happy, that keeps that vibe kind of up and running. And as long as there's just enough people to fill in these menial shitty jobs that keeps the unemployment level, I'm being incredibly simplistic, but it just feels like, yeah, that we're, we're just, it feels like we're hanging on by a thread kind of thing. And I know that we're not, but, depending on your algorithms and depending on who yeah. you interact with online, it either feels really good or really bad and on the brink of, and then you got climate change on top of that. Whenever something happens, it feels like, Oh, don't ever have a child because you'd be bringing them into this unfair, cruel world, which is true, but that's true of any generation. I mean, I don't know. The boomers had it pretty good. Boomers had it great. The boomers had it the best. They had a special time. Yeah, I think like part of the issue is everybody wants what the boomers had, and that was just rare. I don't think it can God. be ever replicated. Like they had jobs and like housing and all this stuff, and that was a rare thing. Like no other generation before them really had that. Mm-hmm. Um, and then they had it, and like you can argue about what they've done with it since, but yeah. Well, I can. I would. <laughs> I don't even think it needs arguing about what they've done with it since. I don't know. The generational divides are kind of funny too. Um, Yes, it's tough. Sometimes people say, you guys are so millennial. And I'm like, I don't know. I am a millennial. I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know what to do. Yeah. This, I wanted to read this, this rant from this guy who has you blocked. Yeah, I can't believe he has me blocked. Uh, yeah, well, ugh. but he's referring to Jamie Dimon's, the CEO of JP, JP Morgan. Morgan, had this, um, had this speech that he gave in 2016 that recently made the rounds. And Jamie Dimon is basically saying, how things are better than ever and things are actually really good and whatnot. And this guy's a doomer, but, and this is, this is the, the poisonous allure of doomerism. It feels really, really smart. It feels really, um, it feels really data driven and it feels really, uh, it just feels like, yeah, this guy's right. Like, cause then on the other side, bullishness and eternal optimism just feels kind of like, well, I mean, you were, so, you were saying in your piece about the, there's a, there's a profit drive with, Doomers. well, like kind of like being a shitty person and, and being negative yeah. and, and, and being that pessimistic. Yeah. I mean, he's probably selling a newsletter subscription. <laughs> probably. But he yeah. says, Jamie Dimon is, is, is as out of touch on America as it comes. I get in lifts and the drivers are working three extra hours driving after their two job shifts just to put food on the table. Bartenders are trying to get by on 35000 a year. When the cost of living doubled or more in the last year, people are unable to afford basic daycare, polluted and crooked mindsets about both genders permeate society. He's talking about society too. Uh, baby boomers hoard more and more assets, sweeping up things with cash funded by taxpayer welfare, blah, blah, blah. The country is dying in every way. In the literal sense, highest suicides ever in a single year, birth rate collapsing, apathy towards the future. Nuclear family dead, consumer addiction, biggest wealth gap in human history, education and oh attainment level for young men collapsing and many have checked out young forever. men <laughs> young men billionaires like munger and buffett tell us we've got it better than ever you can order sushi at home from a 1099 slave contracted by a company that doesn't even make a profit survey the population give me a break 
maybe I'm just outdated and what I want is a relic of the past. Yes, sure, there, maybe there's nothing we can do at all to stop the seemingly permanent trajectory towards decline at the end, but I'd sure as hell love to see one last hurrah. It's, it's the little things like, yeah, talking about the apathy toward the future, consumer addiction, and the wealth disparity that really hit home for me that make me feel like we got to do something to change. And that's where I do feel optimistic, is that we're in such a good position to be able to go in and make the, the, the tweaks necessary to really make it a society that benefits everybody fully so that there aren't those instances of, yeah, Lyft drivers working their third extra hour after two jobs that they work otherwise. Yeah, I mean, I think wealth inequality is a big driver behind why the vibes feel so bad. Because, yeah. like, you see these people, you know, like Jamie Dimon or, like, David Solomon who – you know, they're CEOs, so they get paid uh, a lot of money, but, like, they get paid way more than the lowest paid worker at their firms. And, like, that gap between CEO pay and lowest paid worker has, like, expanded, I think, I think a hundred times. Yeah. Oh, like, yeah. it's gotten massive. And so I think that's part of the issue is that we just have a lot, like this guy was saying who has me blocked, uh, we just have a lot of wealth concentration, and that's really difficult to deal with. But, but so is this trending down? Because... I don't know if I read it in yours or or somewhere else, but it was that stuff like that where there might be a lot of noise about people working three jobs and, and shittier jobs more and more. But it but, means a strong labor market. But aren't um Good point. but yeah. aren't people working better jobs with better pay? Mm -hmm. Like if you're looking at the yeah. statistics. Mm -hmm. I found that very like yeah. promising at least. Yeah. Um it's not I think from what we hear, it's that everyone is losing their job and having to work the worst yeah. job ever. But but wages are real wages are improving. They and, are finally. Uh, and I would say that gigification has kind of gone down. Like you don't really see people turning to Lyft as much. It's actually Lyft has like a crisis of drivers at this point. Um, they're turning more to like office jobs and like manufacturing jobs too. Now everybody wants to be a UPS driver, so yeah. it's things like that. Like there are still opportunities. But I would say, like, just because there's opportunities that are better doesn't mean they're, you know, opportunities that people, they should be paid more. Yeah. And on the, on the wealth disparity front, it feels like, it feels like part of it is that not everybody is participating in the rip-roaring bull markets. And if everybody was, yeah. if everybody had a good piece of it, it would do a hell of a lot more for the vibes. Yeah. Because... Yeah, the, the people like Zero Hedge and Hedge Eye and all those perma bears, they're not, I mean, for all I know, they're not participating in it. Therefore, they are always going to be looking at it through a negative lens. Whereas if you're actively just like optimistic toward the future and participating in the, in the bull market, you're more likely to feel optimistic, even if your acute circumstances might be temporarily painful yeah i mean i think stock ownership is like a big important thing that we need to create to be more accessible like another one of my big hot takes that people also hate is i think that fed now which is like the feds um, payment system that they just released i think that needs to be an app that everybody has access to and like you should be able to invest in stocks through that you should be able to invest in treasuries through that because treasuries are yielding like five percent plus so if you just like help people throw money into that they'll be pretty solid right like five percent's great um, and I think there needs to be like, get rid of Venmo, get rid of pay PayPal, get rid of all those other fintech apps, have it in Fed now. And I think that would reduce a lot of the bloat that we see in the fintech system and encourage them to maybe innovate in different directions rather than always having payments. And then also help people save and invest uh, through this centralized app. And like almost every other government has something like this. The United States just has misaligned incentives we do things a little bit differently. yeah we like lobbying <laughs> there, are there huge margins to be squeezed from fed now can, can no. i can but I, people hate it because they're like well the fed would track me and it's like you're not that important yeah. like you're being tracked by it's i don't know it's it's this strange thing where these things that could like materially change your lives or lives are are like well i would have to give some, some data up yeah for that. But, biometrics but like any fucking tech company wants it and you're like oh sure but what do you need like blood 
Blood yeah. sample, urine sample. Agree. <laughs> Agree. <laughs> yeah. They love private companies. For uh, some just reason. just bring in the um, cameras into my home, and uh, it's like in the listening device. You know what TSA? They take it. your picture now. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Cool. Yeah. yeah. Good. Take it. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of weird. They were like, th- we delete this right after, um, but they look at your license and they take a picture and they like match you to your license. Huh. Yeah. So the government's doing it anyway. Do Listen. they delete it? I don't know. Probably not. Yeah, but then, well, they might. But then, do they empty trash? <laughs> That's the real yeah. question. Do also, they clean hard drive? <laughs> I got pinned up against the glass because I, I I made a joke. I said, "Yeah, right, dude. I can see you're jacking off to it." And he did not like that. <laughs> no, I'm joking. That's not. I didn't actually do that. No. <laughs> uh, I I I wanted to share this. Um, I mean, this this Packy McCormick mm, uh, yeah. had this piece about optimism, and it's just to counter the negativity that I just shared. Excuse me, I've got. Diet Coke burps. See, that's why I can't. That's why it's I can't. It's just like the SAT. <laughs> oh, no, that was, trust me when I say that was a million times worse. And I wonder how many people left that SAT going, that this fucking kid just had to shit the whole time and his stomach would not shut up. And it made it's me get. It's so quiet in there, too. Oh, it's so quiet. They should play music. I feel like that's like testing environments are really. Or cool. white noise or something. Yeah. 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 Anyway. Packy says here, uh, this this whole article is about optimism and that there's a lot to be optimistic about yeah. in, in biotech, in in the superconductors uh, thing, which is uh, turning out to be uh, more more bunk than than not. But um, AI and all, all this stuff. But he says we're shifting from indefinite pessimism and insanity to what I'll call pragmatic optimism. A balanced, real, realistic optimism focused on achievable progress. Over the past 18 months, prevailing sentiment became irrationally pessimistic based on how bad we heard everything was and turned pragmatically optimistic based on our lived experience that it wasn't. I think he's talking about, you know, it felt like the end of the world. I mean, there was an entire it. year of pretty much every yeah. yes. uh, publication being like we are going to get hit with a wave of right. the worst financial and he goes on to say social media amplified and spotlighted extreme views and after the violent amplification mm-hmm. of extreme views on both ends we're settling somewhere more sane reality is mm-hmm. winning and reality is pretty good actually but his uh, the biggest part that i really like is how he says optimism shapes reality and an optimism foundation and an optimistic foundation excuse me is necessary to leverage instead of impede the benefits of these technologies. Yeah. And I think that that's huge. Yeah. If cuz the 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 downside the downside to pessimism is pretty limited. It's just like, all right, yeah, just total destruction, boom, done. The the upside to optimism is Mars. We're going Mars. Mars. <laughs> Mars. We're going. Mars is sure, the best place. I, I think you need a. I think you need a healthy. I think you need a healthy dose of reality to, so you don't seem out of, of course. touch. I mean, I think like, I was like, if I was a sitting president right now, I think I would stand up, be mindful of, of what we've accomplished, but also not be not shy away from talking about some of these inequities and oh, and yeah. what needs to be fixed. Uh, you know. If I was, it's, uh, yeah, it's, we've ghosts. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so, I mean, I don't know. You need to, you need to be able to do, yeah, do both, I think. Yeah, he, I mean, he goes on real fast. He says, it's almost as if we simulated the worst case scenarios virtually and came back more confident in the real world. On the ground, while there are weaknesses in real, real estate and household wealth, household wealth, and while a recession may still hit, right now jobs are plentiful, wages are growing, inflation is cooling, Inequality is shrinking and manufacturing is booming. Yeah. And I think it's just, it's one of those things where it's not going to ever be perfect. Yeah. And it's not going to be, it's not going to feel good because there are going to be bits and pieces and and segments that are, like you said, tech is one of the ones where we're seeing a lot of people getting laid off. But But that's the one that feels good. I think people feel good when they see tech (laughs) and financial sectors getting reamed. He's saying it, not me. But I mean, even then that's, Probably due to the pullback in all of the. I mean, they overhired. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I mean, I think he's right. Like, there's a lot of things to be excited about, like nuclear energy. The superconductor is probably not working, but like something like that is really exciting. So well, we might have made like a cool new magnetic thing or something. Yeah. <laughs> you know, in my fridge. <laughs> yeah, new magnets. Hell yeah. Yeah. Um, but it, I don't know. It's just like, I mean, I I'm an optimist. Like Good. all of my stuff trends towards optimism, um, but I think that. 
like what Paggy's talking about here, and it's a good article, but like it's all very meta. And I think like the beginning of our conversation was more localized, right? So like the average experience might not be so good. And like, okay, maybe we do get nuclear technology, but all of that takes a long time to like take impact. So I think that's the big issue is like, how do we sort of make people feel better right now? And people are feeling better, especially compared to I think this time last year. Uh, and Biden, and Bidenomics has done a lot of work and, you know, sort of avoiding the recession. So the way that we've been able to escape a downturn is because fiscal policy, because of the CHIPS Act, because of the IRA, because of the IIGA. And so I think now the question is, like, can we maintain, can we maintain that level of spending? Um, and I, I don't know. Yeah, I think it's... Uh, <laughs> Please don't even mic pick that up. Someone outside just said hello. Oh, just so I, I oh, I'm with you there on the optimism, and it it it's it goes back to what I was saying before, where I feel guilty talking about it. it. Yeah, yeah, because. It's kind of like when you were a kid and your dad would say, finish your food because they're starving children in other mm -hmm. countries. It's it's like, yeah, I, I understand that. But that doesn't mean that I should be miserable, too, and have that same outlook. No, it does. You can't have happiness until everyone does. There's like there's social pressure to have anxiety yes. about things. Yeah. Yes. There's more Which equity in 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 feeling bad, complaining and feeling bad yeah. and saying, aren't things really... Man, everything sucks, huh? Yeah. And I well, feel and our like brains like sorry to keep on like no, no, uh, go ahead. but like our brains love like being sad. Like we Especially mine. Yeah, I know same. <laughs> <laughs> it's just like yeah, we just trend towards negativity cuz like we're animals, you know, mm -hmm. and we have to protect ourselves. So if we see something negative, as we were talking about their comment section, like we're going to be more likely to pay attention to that. And that's the thing that you have to, you know, battle too is like Brains love negative information. Yeah. And people have tried to do the like positive uh, and you're like, yeah. oh, I hate your whole yeah. fucking thing, dude. Yeah. Remember what? like John Krasinski was like, oh, we got good news. <laughs> and and like, then he sold it for $40 million. And what? It's like, yeah, you oh, got yeah. good news, dude. He sold SGN, some good news network or whatever for like, <laughs> like Wait, is he the office of guy? Yeah. yeah. Okay. He sold it to like Disney or something and then they did uh, nothing with it. He Disney. just, he just. Disney's, Disney probably bought it up because they wanted to protect optimism or something. <laughs> <laughs> That's our whole thing. Yeah. We're supposed to be happy. I we remember, can only cry I remember seeing a guy throw up when I was a kid at Disneyland <laughs> and it ruined the allure. He, he just like, I was in the bathroom and it was a hot summer day and he came out and he <laughs> took his uh, baseball cap off and put it to his chest as if he was about to be paying attention to the national anthem and just <laughs> hurled into a trash can. Oh, and I remember thinking, God. damn, that is bleak. <laughs> and I was like six. Well, uh, this is not relative to throwing up, but like there's also people are more likely to spend if they're angry. Mm. So you're more likely to engage with your vices. Like you're more likely to smoke or drink or like buy junk food. Uh, and so there is also that sort of incentive in place. You know, if you keep people angry, they're going to be spending, right? They're going to be spending. They're going yeah. to be clicking. Yeah. They're, they're going to be, be coming back for more. I mean, and, and ads are so interesting because Apple and like privacy and all that. Apple and Google are going up against the government essentially over privacy because the government's like, whoa, like you kind of have a lot of data on people and you sort of have a monopoly and it's a little creepy. And so the government's like, well, maybe we'll regulate this like how Europe's doing. And so now we're going to see a lot more ads because they can't do, um, what's it called when they, like, targeted ads? Mm. It, like, targeted ads are going to be harder to, to get across um, because of some privacy laws. And so now it's going to be just a, a swarm of ads. Like, we're exposed to 10,000 ads a day. Like, I was in the Uber in the, in, on the way here, and all along the four or five ads, ads, ads everywhere. In the Uber, there's yeah. an ad. And that little you stuff. iPad, yeah. It's just, and I think that too, like, you feel like you're not even a person. You're just like something to spend money. Um, if you go on Instagram, it's like a bunch more ads than you're used to. Twitter too now, or X. And so I think <laughs> like uh, we're just sort of bogged down by being consumers versus being seen as people, which I think also to the point about like optimism and feeling bad is, is feels bad. Be yeah. sure to sign up for our Patreon. <laughs> Patreon. <laughs> I had to put it. But, in but it's, it's, it's not your fault. Like, no. like you have to have ads because yeah. everything has to be free or a subscription model. Mm -hmm. right? right. And so like the ways that you monetize, you're just sort of 
stuck in a corner. Feel bad about. I've definitely had those moments driving on LA freeways where I'm tripping out at there are just these giant things. Billboards, yeah. Just just flashing at you. Hey dipshit, yeah. look up here. Yeah. Like look. Yeah. My favorite thing is <laughs> two? I had the one, but I changed just it for you. midway through. Yeah, I paid extra to have it changed. Yeah, that was fun. My favorite thing is when is when the billboard is an ad for itself. Oh yeah, oh, this like, billboard never here. turns yeah. off. They're like, yeah. look how sick this is. Don't you want this to be your business? Yeah, this is yeah. your space. <laughs> yeah. Um, can we talk a little bit about your uh, your fast company article about Gen Z? And yeah, I feel whole, it. The ties um, into all this. Yeah. Yeah. So that's you kind of explain what maybe you can boil it down a little bit. Of Gen Z has had this unique experience of like being born into the wake of the financial crash and then just kind of getting hit with a sorry it's the noisiest uh <laughs> yeah and i can see it jumping that this is definitely uh, getting big oh i could talk about car culture too oh boy i can't stand cars yeah. and i oh my gosh i have so many hot takes on cars because i think it ties into sort of what we're saying too like you get in these giant pickup trucks and i people are gonna hate this but like you get in your giant pickup truck and you're so you're isolated you're isolated from the world and so i feel like they're bigger than ever yeah and so you're just like there's a lack of community that's like based in how we transport yes. ourselves. Yes. Oh yeah. Yeah. In in in, in L. A. People oh, love to yeah. flip each other off yeah, and risk so getting shot because yeah. that's I saw this fucking like, like old man accidentally I don't know do something to piss someone off so they honked and he rolled down his window and just said fuck to you <laughs> fuck to you With the, flipping off uh, Jesus it's the isolating but anyway yeah. continue yeah but Gen Z. Um, yeah, I mean, so like Gen Z was born essentially into the dot com bubble. And so they don't remember a lot. I'm, I'm part of it, Cusper, but 97. And they don't remember a lot of the dot com bubble, but then you're like 10 and the financial crisis happens. So like there's a lot of, mem- like you all know, like there's a lot of memories from that. And then when I graduated school six months after that, the pandemic happened. So I never really had like a regular job and like neither did a lot of people in that age group. And so I think it sort of ties into what we've been saying this whole time. It's like the way that you think about work has to change because work doesn't promise what it used to like for your parents or your parents' parents, like they could, you know, it's sort of like those return accounts on Twitter, but they could support a family on a salary, a single salary, get a home, have that American dream. And I think a lot of people are like, well, wow, number one, we all almost died. Like we all (laughs) almost died. Like there was a global pandemic where we were locked inside for two years and we're just like moving on like that didn't happen. And so I think a lot of people are trying to figure out what they are passionate about and just focus on that because, you know, as far as we know, you only have one life and you might as right. well do something with it. And then I think also just the way that they can think about work is, is totally different. Yeah. Yeah. It feels like the pandemic kind of showed everybody how the sausage is made in yeah. the sense that this is all made up. Well, everything really. that like the social promises that were in place totally disappeared like, it was like, oh, take care of your neighbor. Like, be nice to each other. All of a sudden, no. Like, you know, so you had some people who weren't following protocols or just like, it just seemed like every, it was every man for themselves. And like, the government did a lot to support people and to make sure that those who had lost their jobs were were okay. But I would say like, it was an isolating experience in terms of being like a citizen. Which I do think, not to go back to that, I, I think that might also have a big impact on the way people feel right now about the economy. It was the first time people kind of felt taken care of. Yeah. People, I mean, those uh, unemployment, those enhanced unemployment payments were like huge for people. They were and they were like, holy shit, I lost my job and I'm not... In trouble. Yeah, I'm not in trouble. I'm not going to lose my house. I'm not going to... Mm-hmm. Um, the delayed rent payments. <clears throat> the st- I mean, yeah, yeah renter yeah, protections. I forgot about that, People yeah. had never experienced something like that. And the thing is, it's possible. Right. right. Yeah. And so and now all of that has gone away. And, you know, the last vestige of it is we have about we have just a few weeks before the clock runs out on student loans being turned on. And then it's like we're back to normal. Everything, everything that you saw is. Yeah. I mean, it seemed like, in, I, you know, I wrote about this when it was all kind of happening. But like it seemed like once the pandemic was somewhat over, it was like time to save the economy, like time to get back to work, everybody. Right. And I was like, well, maybe it's still not safe for that. Or like, it, so like, it just seemed like everything was at the expense of the economy. And um, yeah, people, I think, became very aware of the cog in the machine thing, like you were saying. 
Right. So how do you think, uh, I don't know. How do you see like your generation becoming like, what do you think their relationship with work will be like as people, I don't know, enter, I think it's in your twenties. It's, there's a probably a lot more people who are like, I'm going to, I'm going to go for this. Yeah. Take the risk. Creator economy or riskier situation. But I think like, how do you think people will kind of settle in after that? Do you think they'll carry that with them this, independent mindset or i, I mean it, i i think that even millennials kind of shirk it off right i mean they're sometimes when i hear i have a lot of friends who work in tech like all my friends are in their 30s and um I don't, life at google sounds good like and when i hear them complaining about how it's soul sucking or whatever i'm mm. like you know, got equity that. yeah sorry, my <laughs> yeah. tummy rumble get picked up did you hear it all the way over there <laughs> fuck but <laughs> But yeah, I don't know. Uh, it's that that feeling feels like it's probably not just unique to Gen Z. No, it's probably, it's probably yeah. much more intense Universal, there. But yeah, but yeah, work is not loving people back. Mm. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's not like a family anymore. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, and it, like that was one thing when the article got published. Like everybody in my comments was like, "Millennials did this. Millennials felt the same way." And look at them now; they're doing corporate life. And so, like, why do you think that Gen Z would would change anything? And it's like, at one point, something will have to change. At one point, someone will do something. And so, I don't know exactly what it will look like. I think jobs, like, my job is crazy, right? Um, Your guys' jobs are kind of crazy. Um, Kind of wild, yeah. Yeah, so I think it's it's that sort of thing. Like, there are new opportunities and new avenues for people to explore. But, like, I don't know. There's this whole thing about, you know, can everybody do what they're passionate about, like, like, what does that look like? And then how do you help people discover their passions? Um, and that's a whole other discussion. But I think you're right. Like, it's like, I don't know what it'll look like, but it seems like things are sort of rumbling. I always think of that. that <laughs> did you ever watch Mad Men? No. Oh. Well, there's a French. Remember Don Draper's French wife? Nope. Didn't watch Jesus Mad Men, dude. Jesus Christ. Thank you, yeah, Dylan. You. Okay. But... Uh, She's kind of coming to terms with her dreams not coming true. And I remember her f- mm. her French mom is there and she's like consoling her. And she just says, well, the whole world cannot be full of uh, baseball players and ballerinas. Damn. And I was Damn. like, it's kind of true. true. That baseball ballerina world does sound pretty tight, though. <laughs> <laughs> you hit a game and then you tap it, you know, cap it off with a nice um, ballet nutcracker or something. But it does feel like people are uniquely uh, unfulfilled. Yeah, and I and I don't know. I think that's like social media and yeah, because it's always. I been hate that way. saying that because it's like social media. It's just like um, I think you know. There's comparison, so you look at other people's lives. You see their highlight reel, right? Everybody right. does that, and you're like, man, they're living their best life, and I'm alone and sad. And it's like they, things kind of suck for me. And so I think that's part of that too. And then also, I think that you were saying like people just kind of consume. I think people do consume more than they produce because. Uh, we have this idea that unless you're like really, really good at certain types of arts, you shouldn't pursue them. So people will like do violin or paint when they're younger. And then the, like when they graduate school, they're like, well, can't do that anymore. I'm not that good at it. Not and so make money at it. Yeah. And yeah. so like the monetized passion thing is, I think, getting in the way also. Like people don't pursue things that they care about because they're like, I can't make money from it. You're saying being mediocre at tennis is the answer to your uh, <laughs> Is that your solution? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 No, but I, I, I want to, I, I hate if this is um, awkward, but I want to read uh, part of your article just because it kind of speaks to the bleakness of the jobs too. Um, so you say, the upshot of all this inequality and self-dealing is that the promise of work as the means the American dream feels unattainable. Why work 50, 60, 100 hours a week only for someone else to siphon out all the value? And then there's the work itself. According to Microsoft's 2023 study of workplace productivity trends, almost 60% of people's time is spent using office software for communication, email mostly. That's a huge creative energy vortex. The prevailing work culture defined by baby boomers and Gen X is already outmoded in being able to, to deliver the freedom Gen Z seeks, and now it's being further challenged. We're entering a vast unknown with artificial intelligence and the continued gigification of the economy while we're still dealing with the pandemic overhang of high... Overhang of hybrid and remote jobs. Pretty good. Thanks. But I think that's, uh, I think that like captures it perfectly. You know, people are supposed to feel like they've gotten 
everything they want and they get there and they, you're just going, what, what do I even do mm-hmm. here? Have you ever read David Graeber's Bullshit Jobs? Yeah. yeah. It feels very much like we're just kind of... Yeah, like a lot of email jobs. Right. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I was talking to a friend who she said, I don't even know what I do, like what I'm she supposed to emails. do. Yeah. It's the vibes, man. It's the vibes. Yeah, I feel like this has been so sad, but like the whole sentiment of the podcast, the vibes of the podcast have been sad. But no, it's, it's, I think it's nuanced. Yeah. There's there's positive vibes. There's pockets. It's but a, like I think it's what a Jackson would, Pollock painting. Ooh, but I think what would be good, like, so your friend who has an email job, does she feel like she can explore her passions outside of her email job, or does she feel tied to her emails? I think I haven't asked her that, um, but I think a lot of people, especially as they start having kids and stuff like that, um, it just kind of becomes like obligations it's like i have work and then i have to like make sure my family oh my gosh and that gets into community and like lack yes. thereof yeah and car uh, culture yeah and suburbanization mm-hmm. and because i don't think you're supposed to raise a family on your own and you're also you're not meant to be exposed to the chronic never-ending cycle of negativity and in it- far-reaching places that doesn't yeah. affect you personally where you end up carrying that guilt yeah carrying that shame it's a lot of things it where is someone things. like that might end up at, might actually be happy and feel fulfilled if when your Maslow's hierarchy of needs are mm-hmm. being met, but it because of your exposure to these things, because you're comparing and despairing and seeing what other people are doing supposedly with their lives, and because you're seeing all the inequality and all the bad stuff, it weighs down the things that would otherwise be positive or neutral in your own life. Yeah. I wrote this article. It was my most recent one about like why people feel the economy is bad. Mm. And one thing that I mentioned was unintentional oblivion. So I feel like we're exposed to like a lot of the negativity and it's kind of like, how do I solve it? Like, what do I do? And I feel like that's sort of what has happened with this conversation is like, we're talking about all these bad things, but it's like, where do you even begin to fix it? And I think that is also a big part of the bad vibes. It's like, okay, we probably have to have like government intervention for some of this stuff. Obviously can't really rely on the private market to fix it, which I know is like another hot take, but yeah, it's just, I think it's like that sort of thing too. It's like we have these issues, these clear issues, and how do you fix them? Yeah, I agree. I think government intervention could do, do a lot. pinko? Well, yeah, I, I What's think... Pinko? Like oh, a pinko is someone with like a uh, communist sense. Uh, oh, yeah. Inko Kami. I don't know. I just know the word. Inko. It's because they're reds. If you are um, pink, you are... Um, like a light commie? Yeah, you're, you're like... So it's racist? No. Okay, good. Because we don't want YouTube. We want to please YouTube. We want to please the yeah, We don't want to them. upset them. It means you're sympathetic to communist... Things? Yeah. Speaking of sympathy, uh, you know who I'm... S- not very sympathetic toward was, David Solomon. Oh, the 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 former is he the current CEO of he's Goldman still Sachs? The CEO, yeah, yeah. Current CEO. Yeah. current CEO of Goldman Sachs, who is now um he he's been, <laughs> wait. So why did you want to, you specifically oh. requested that we talk about this? Well, because you had mentioned Jamie Dimon, and I was mm. like, here's another bank CEO, and you know we love clowning on dudes. Yeah, well, <laughs> we do. We absolutely love to clown. I don't know. I feel bad. Like. So the article is just talking about him and like he's a DJ and, and he's, he's also a dick. <laughs> he's also the CEO of Goldman Sachs yes. and makes a bunch of money. And in the article, they're talking about like how he still went to the office during the pandemic. And one person was like, I don't think this guy has anything going on outside of work. And it's just like, dang, you know? Yeah. So for when I was reading the article, it was it just kind of. I always have this thought that like we are all of these people in power are these like um, deeply wounded people yeah. carrying around huge amounts of resentment. And, and we are the uh, we bear the brunt of that because and so like they go into all of his. You know, I, I don't know if you re- like read the, it talks about his kind of origin story there. He was denied by them twice. They told him yeah. you're just not Goldman Sachs material. So he went another route and worked with different investment firms and then got their attention and they were like oh maybe after all he can do this and so he um 
they called him like the lateral or whatever because he was able to make partner not by climbing up the ranks of Goldman Sachs, but by doing it outside. And yeah, I don't know. You just have this, like some of these, you just feel bad for him. He's just like a, he's got, everyone seems to hate his whole general yeah. vibe. <laughs> I know. And it's just like, and to have all that exposed in a New York mag article, it's like, yeah. I feel bad. I feel bad for the airplane girl. That's who I feel bad for. I feel bad for the people. And I, I would like to touch on this kind of thing in the bonus episode because we are absolutely going to talk about commenters and internet weirdos. But like that woman's life got upended because she had a bad day. And that's that's my least I think that's my least favorite thing about America and about culture right now is that everybody's always ready to take out their phone and film you having you your about, bad day. Wait, are you talking about the woman who's like, that guy's not real? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Yeah. And there was, I saw on the Los Angeles subreddit. Wait, are was, we done with Diesel? No, no, I'm just uh. quickly doing a, a tangent. There was this woman on the Los Angeles subreddit who talked about how in traffic on the freeway over the weekend, some guy road raged on her and her husband and started like beating up, got out of his car, pulled her husband out of the car, started fighting oh him and she was begging someone to call 911 and she just saw multiple people driving oh. by filming it instead and it's just ooh what's like the bystander what's that bystander, bystander effect, effect. Yeah. yeah which i think was debunked oh okay well <laughs> but so does i what i want to know about Diesel is does he suck as a dj or is he pretty good oh well, he would he book Lollapalooza. um again i don't know how Nepo hard it baby is yeah, it's uh, probably nepotism. I just love his bad vibe. So it was like, <laughs> <laughs> so, so when they were auditioning him to become CEO, they had the bank's image specialist had to give him tips on becoming more approachable. Oh right. Uh, they suggested he walk the floors more often and create opportunities for small talk, perhaps by stopping at an assistant's desk to take a piece of candy. When hey. I when I told him you got to stick your hand in the candy bowl, he just gave me this look like. Why would I do that? How is that productive? Recalls someone involved in the effort. The exercise did not, su- not succeed in endearing Solomon to the golden rank and file. He would stomp around the floors in a really purposeful way, and he'd find the, the two or three people he knew. He'd knock on their door, and they would get scared. The whole thing didn't work. Oh, my God. I had a boss like this once. It, yeah, he was... Um, I feel like a lot of bosses are like this. Yeah. Couldn't be me if I were a boss. I'd be so cool. Yeah? Yeah, I'd be walking around... Taking that candy. Taking that candy? Yeah. Oh, yeah. But yeah, then, so he ended up, he was buying fucking, he bought private planes and was using them to t- using them to go to his DJ gigs. Well, he bought and, them, the, he made Goldman Sachs buy them. Yeah, pictures of Solomon and DJ booths at, at venues from Napa Valley to Lollapalooza, looking like the how do you do fellow kids meme brought to life, <laughs> embarrassed the most image sensitive institution in finance. So wait, you felt bad for him in this yeah, article. Yeah, I still do. I have a hard time feeling. Uh, yeah, yeah. Why? So why do you pray tell? Why do you feel bad for him? Just because his whole shit is getting blown up in in, in New York? Because it's just hard for anyone to. I'm an empath, I guess. <laughs> yeah, but yeah. I don't I know. It. It's just like. I think like, that says a lot about you that you can feel bad for. Yeah, I mean, in it, anyone I didn't, in that so such like position. when I like when I so when I was out here when I lived out here um, mm-hmm. and worked in finance, like it was a little similar. Like it didn't really fit into the firm. Um, was a blind resume hire. And so I, I think like the industry is just really tough and it can really take a lot out of you. And so I just like, he seems like he's trying, and obviously he's a jerk. Like the whole BJ comment was like, okay, dude, like why are you bragging about that? But um, he got a blowjob. Yeah, for those of you who don't know, uh, one of the most like damning reports was that it, it leaked that Solomon, who was divorced, had once boasted to a group of colleagues. I bet I was the only one who got a blowjob last night. That's just strange. Thing. Insane. Oh, Behind his back, snickering executives gave him a mortifying new nickname, BJ Diesel, because he used to call himself DJ Diesel because he's a DJ. Continue. Yeah. I mean, now after that, I sound dumb being like, I feel no, bad. No, no. But I don't know. It's just like, I think it goes back to what we were talking about with like how every. it's just like. I think a lot of people think they'll be really, really happy if they have a lot of money. And it really helps. Having money really helps, of course. But (laughs) you still have guys like this who have all the money and all the power. Right. And you're still unhappy. No matter matter how much um, 
No matter how much money you have, it's never going to feel good reading. David's not likable, says a longtime colleague. <laughs> One of the more diplomatic comments I heard in talking to more than 30 of the CEOs, current former executives, most of them partners. He's a prick, says another. Everybody thinks and says he's a dick. He's a tough guy with a very short fuse. I feel bad. This one made me feel bad because he's like, they come at you for anything. Like, I don't know why he put this in there. Solomon could also be sensitive about his image. After a reporter described him as paunchy in a 2011 article, Solomon confronted her, grabbing the fleshy inches covering his midsection. He demanded, do you think this is a paunch? That's brutal. Oh, my God. For, he's a CEO. I don't know. Yeah. How much is he worth? Oh. He's got to be much. worth over $100 million. Yeah. Easily. But yeah, that I don't, it's this like horrible thing. Where he he talks about well, his loneliness and everything and it's like. It's kind of like, okay, Elon Musk is like the same oh, yeah. oh. sort of vibe. I think they kind of all are. I, yeah. I don't feel bad for him though. I just can't. He's oh, blown it at every bad. opportunity. He's so... He lacks any kind of self. This guy at least seems somewhat self-aware. Yeah. Elon Musk just takes it above and beyond. It's just, I wish bad things upon that. And, and uh, I, I I saw that he takes ketamine for for depression, and I'm like, oh, you, you <laughs> fucking what? Do you, mm. He's just like you. Yeah, he's just like me. I he should wants get another you to session. think that. Yeah, he wants me to think that. Where do you stand on the Elon spectrum? Uh, not he's not asking <laughs> where you are on the spectrum. <laughs> he's, asking, <laughs> he's asking. Oh, I get DMs about that too. <laughs> Anyway, but like, uh, <laughs> um, I, 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 um, I'm really disappointed because I really loved Twitter. Like Twitter was me too. Where I made a lot of friends and all this stuff, and um, it's just a bummer. I think that you can have like one really rich guy be like, "Here's my 44 billion dollar financed by all these banks, and I'm gonna call it X and do all this stuff and destroy it essentially." And make myself the main character. And I think like going, yeah, going back to the points about like how people are feeling bad. Now the website is encouraging you to post like the most extreme takes possible so you can make ad revenue mm -hmm. off of it. So yeah. people engage. Um, and I think that's harmful. And anytime you click on a tweet now, because you used to be able to see, there would be like a discussion under there and now it's, it, it, prioritizes the, the blue, blue checks. checks and so you get a lot of just like yeah no, i want to see what people actually think about this i don't want to see what the most like sycophantic yeah insane people think and like with elon i think he he's very smart obviously like you know he's a good businessman but he, like he thought honey was an animal oh yeah, <laughs> yeah, what? Tweet, yeah. honey he thought it was being interesting he said honey is neither fungi animal or plant I think we're really finding out though that maybe he's not all that smart no. and he's like maybe a little bit dumb. He got I think a little lucky, which yeah. I think you always need luck. I think he's smart for sure. I mean, he's smart, but he's not like yeah, one of the clearly. smartest men to ever live kind of thing. He's he's a good he's a good businessman, mm -hmm. which lends itself to being a good bullshitter. And he's a good cult leader. He's a good cult yeah. leader, he's a good salesman, he's a good bullshitter. Uh But again, I think it honestly goes back to the thing I like it feels like Grimes, they asked Grimes yeah. about the like where this all comes from, and it's like it's like wounded, wounded warrior bullshit. Where he's just like he feels like attacked, and like he needs to carry this fight for w w I don't even know why it's for himself. And for now his we're ego. all the like we just the have to. Pawns. <laughs> it's all yeah, it's awful. Wrong, Mars. We should end there, right? We're in an hour 15. Would you like to stay in and do bonus or do you have to go back to airport? No, no, not until 11.59 p.m. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Why would you do it to yourself? Yeah. And then I'm seeing one of my friends. Oh, okay, cool. Uh, so, folks. Oh. <laughs> Are you okay? Yeah, no, I, I was just going to just end it. But then um, thank you so much for joining us. And we hope that this has been as uh, illuminating for you as it has been for us. I know it has been for me. I love talking about this shit. And um, I hope it didn't feel disjointed. Did it feel disjointed? Definitely. Oh, fuck. No, I mean, I think there's like a lot of threads. Yes. Yeah. 
No. A lot of threads, but we appreciate you coming on. Yeah. Yes, we we're do. gonna have you back. Thank yeah. you. It's always excited fun. for the book. Buy my book. Yes. <laughs> yeah, pre order the book. Pre order the book. Yeah, what do you want to plug? <laughs> my Social book. media's yeah. To, where can people find you and all people know, but well, I tell don't them. Know. Like I I'm on Twitter or whatever. I'm on Twitter at Kyla Skin, Instagram at Kyla Skin. I have a newsletter, Kyla.substack.com. My podcast, which is also my YouTube, which is called Let's Appreciate, and then I'm on YouTube as well. On TikTok at Kyla Skin, um, yeah, and then I do like a bunch of other projects. So, and do the book is called favor. In This Economy. Sorry, okay, and it's out in April 2024. When in when do pre orders start? I mean, that's probably a while no, a ways away. No, it should be up by now. But like we oh, have to okay. we have to get it up still. So. Oh, pre well, yeah. I think by the time this comes up, it'll it comes out. It'll be up. It's so contingent on the book cover. Yeah, make sure you pre order pre order the book. Yes. If you have any questions, I uh, can't wait to read it. Yeah, you can. Yeah, leave a nice comment too, please. Yeah, tell me I'm doing great. Yes. Please. Yeah, <laughs> Kyla deserves it. Yeah. Also follow Kyla on everything because she's follow awesome you guys really too. <laughs> yeah, if you're not you. already following them, yeah. follow. <laughs> okay, we'll see you. In We're gonna the, dick around in the bonus. We'll episode. see you in the bonus and um, bye. I'm we love pee. you. Bye. <laughs>